Good morning, and thank you very much, Professor Lee, for that very kind introduction. And thank you very much to the Royal College of Surgeons of England for awarding me the Hunterian Professorship, and to the SCTS and ACTA for hosting the Hunterian Lecture. It is indeed a great honour, uh, privilege and pleasure to be delivering this lecture this morning. John Hunter is considered the founder of scientific surgery. He was the son of a farmer and lived in Glasgow during his early years and went to London when he was about 20 years old to assist in his brother's anatomy school. He studied surgery at the Royal Hospital, Chelsea, and also at St. Bartholomew's Hospital. At 35, he joined St. George's Hospital, and then he bought a large house in Leicester Square, which he used as a museum, a teaching museum. And he spent many hours in research on his museum specimens, teaching by example rather than precept. His experimental approach to the study of physiology resulted in a new scientific attitude to surgery, and he made major contributions to the study of wound healing. Among his achievements was he was made the Surgeon Extraordinary to the King in 1776 and Surgeon General to the Army in 1790. It was very inspiring to read his uh, biography, which was sent to me by the Royal College of Surgeons, and I've just summarized some uh, very brief points here. In the next 20 minutes, I will go through a very brief introduction on functional ischemic mitral regurgitation, the pathophysiology and surgical management. I will then go through some original work in developing a new technique to image the mitral valve using cardiovascular magnetic resonance and the insights gained from this on the normal mitral valve and the ischemic mitral valve. And I'll, I'll spend some time also uh, on the randomized ischemic mitral evaluation trial, the RIME trial, how the results of this compares with other randomized controlled trials if, which I've reported since the RIME trial, and the implications uh, of this for clinical practice. So functional ischemic mitral regurgitation, as we know, and, as, and which has been discussed quite uh, in detail this morning, occurs secondary to myocardial infarction, which causes LV dysfunction and dilatation, both regional and global, and papillary muscle displacement, both epically and laterally. It results in mitral leaflet tethering, usually in the posterior media scallop, this P3 area which we see in the diagram, the so-called Carpentier type 3B leaflet motion restriction during systole. It is fairly common occurring in up to 40% of patients following myocardial infarction, but it's usually mild or moderate in severity, and so it's often ignored. But it is not a benign condition because it occurs, it results in a five times increase in the rates of heart failure and death, and up to one and a half times risk of heart failure and death despite coronary artery revascularization. So this is one of the studies uh, which, which demonstrates that. And y-axis, you see the cumulative probability of death, and the x-axis, the day since the uh, since diagnosis. And you see if there is mild mitral regurgitation, this red line here, the risk of death is twice that compared to those with no mitral regurgitation. And you see similar results for incidence of heart failure. And yet, despite successful revascularization, as we heard earlier, uh, mitral regurgitation, even when mild, remains an independent risk factor for death. Now, functional ischemic MI is a disease of the left ventricle. The mitral valve apparatus is normal in structure, but, but, is, but are pulled apart by distortions in the left ventricle geometry and its impaired function. CMR is the gold standard in assessing left ventricular function, size, and viability, as we heard this morning. So we use CMR to provide additional insights into functional ischemic MR. But to do that, we needed to develop a new imaging sequencing uh, protocol uh, for, this, uh, for this purpose. This is the uh, basal short axis view from a cardiac MRI study, as we saw this morning. And we are looking at the mitral valve from the apex of the LV towards the left atrium. So this is the uh, inverse of what we see in the intraoperative view. So we have A3 here, A2 here, A1 here, P3 here, P2 here, and P1 there. 
Now, when we started uh, this work way back in uh, 2006, nine years ago, these were the standard routine clinical CMR views which were taken. I think Dr. McCann showed that earlier. We, we positioned the slice and image through the middle of the uh, mitral valve to give the three-chamber or the left ventricular outflow tract view. And then we take this oblique slice here across the mitral valve, which gives this four-chamber view. Of course, you see that we have imaged uh, A2 and P2 very well, and we have imaged uh, P1 and A2 very well. But this is a problem in ischemic MR, where the major problem is that in P3 and A3, which is not imaged at all in a routine CMR scan. So we, we, we wanted to develop a new technique which could be easily standardized because CMR, unlike echocardiography, uh, is performed by technologists. And we had to have a, a technique which was reproducible and easily done. So we came up with this uh, stack of mitral valve uh, images whereby the technologists could position, could copy an image slice which would have imaged through the middle of P1 and A1 up towards uh, uh, sorry, P2 and A2 up towards uh, P1 and A1, and then just move these slices uh, downwards across the mitral valve. With a CMR machine, this is fairly easy to do. So these are seven millimeter slices, and we move at five millimeter intervals down uh, across the mitral valve. And with this, you can see that we have then now, uh, we are now able to image all the uh, scallops of the mitral valve, A3P3, A2P2, and A1P1. And you can see in this example how important it is to have uh, used this mitral stack of images because as you can see here, the MR looks severe in the P3A3 region. It looks uh, moderate at most in P2A2, and it looks uh, non-existent or mild in P1A1, emphasizing the importance during cardiac MRI uh, to uh, image across the, the whole of the mitral uh, uh, apparatus. A principle of cardiac MRI is that you have to take the uh, image slice at right angles or orthogonal to the structure. And if we image the, uh, the mitral valve at an angle, you do not get very good uh, resolution. And, that, and this is a problem around the commissural areas. And so two additional views are needed, a position at right angles to the mitral leaflets at the two commissures, the so-called commissural views. And um, using this technique, you can, uh, we can then um, not only get information on the uh, morphology of the mitral valve, but also we have additional information about the annular geometry, uh, in this case, the septal lateral diameter, the commissural commissural diameter. Uh, we have indices of tethering, which we saw earlier, an echocardiography, but cardiac MRI gives very precise uh, measurements of this. Uh, papillary muscle displacement, both laterally and apically, can be measured. And of course, areas of infarction, both in the left ventricle, but also importantly, we can determine areas of infarction in the papillary muscles. So this technique was presented at the Society of Cardiac MRI uh, in 2008, and has since now been used in uh, almost all centers. We published this uh, technique in the uh, Journal of Cardiac MRI um, uh, quite some time ago, and uh, it has now been adopted uh, in routine use in most centers. Using these imaging techniques on healthy volunteers, 10 healthy volunteers, we were able to study very closely the normal annular and leaflet motion uh, in a normal person. This had never been done in cardiac MRI, but uh, had been done using other modalities. And using this technique, you can see that during the cardiac cycle, we can really identify six phases of annular motion and leaflet motion. Uh, left ventricular systole starts in phase six and extends throughout phase one. You can see that this is the septal lateral diameter of the mitral annulus. And the uh, mitral annulus has a pre-systolic contraction just at the start of a systole. And, uh, and this, gets, um, it, this increases in diameter so that the mitral annulus reaches its maximum size 
just before the onset of LV diastole and leaflet opening. There's then uh, a period where the leaflet opens and the annulus recoils backwards on itself, pulling the uh, mitral leaflets further apart. And in phase three, the leaflets then uh, approximates back towards each other. This may be a result of the annular movement, but also the flow of blood around the left ventricle. In phase four, uh, this is a period of a mid-diastolic uh, pause, a truly neutral position of the heart, where the heart is fully relaxed and does not do anything. And then uh, left atrial systolic excursion occurs and uh, leaflet corrosion um, occurs. Uh, using this uh, uh, model, we, uh, we studied both patients with no functional ischemic mitral regurgitation and those with moderate functional ischemic mitral regurgitation. And you can see that in patients with no functional mitral regurgitation, there's this pre-systolic contraction of the mitral annulus, so that it's smallest in size, and then it relaxes uh, in, in diameter. Now, this uh, pre-systolic contraction uh, of the mitral annulus is lost in functional ischemic MR. You can see that the mitral annulus does not change uh, uh, in size very much in ischemic MR. Uh, what is interesting is that if you look at the actual diameter in diastole of the mitral annulus, it is not significantly different uh, in patients with moderate ischemic MR compared to patients with no ischemic MR. And this explains why very often when we uh, uh, do an operation on patients with ischemic MR, we open the left atrium and we assess the mitral valve, it does not appear to be dilated. The mitral analysis is not dilated because we are assessing the mitral analysis in diastole. But, uh, and that, that explains why it's important also, why Professor Dion has told us that we need to place uh, an undersized annuloplasty ring, a, a ring which is two sizes smaller than what we have measured because we have to uh, correct for this loss of systolic contraction in patients with ischemic MR. In other words, we have to fix the mitral annulus back to its uh, maximum uh, systolic contraction uh, diameter. Along with this, uh, we, we, we determined that not surprisingly, patients with ischemic MR had greater tethering indices as measured by the tethering uh, distance and the tethering area as well. But what was interesting was that also we identified that in patients with ischemic MR, the maximal leaflet separation was much reduced as compared to normal patients. And this is almost certainly related to the loss of this uh, contractile function in the mitral annulus. Because as you saw earlier in the uh, diagram, the motion of the, of the mitral leaflets are tied in with the motion of the mitral annulus. Uh, when we look at indices of papillary muscle displacement, we found that the papillary muscles were displaced further apart from each other. The red bars are those with ischemic MR, the blue bars are normal patients, and the displacement was most pronounced posteriorly and laterally, but not so much apically. I was quite pleased when I uh, asked Dr. Miller at the first session what his results with the sheet models were, uh, and which was exactly the same. His answer was that the uh, displacement in sheep was mostly posterior and laterally and not so much apically. And this is certainly what we found also in, in our patients. The normal uh, uh, papillary muscle in patients contracts by about 30 to 40 percent uh, in patients. And this is to maintain the uh, competency of the mitral valve apparatus. If you can imagine as the left ventricle contracts, the papillary muscles needs to contract as well so that there's no leaflet prolapse. Uh, this uh, contractile function of the papillary muscle is impaired in uh, ischemic MR. It may actually be a means to uh, reduce ischemic MR uh, uh, in this condition. And certainly, it, it re very rarely causes ischemic MR uh, papillary muscle dysfunction. We identified papillary muscle infarction in about a third of cases, most pronounced in the posterior media papillary muscle, but also in some cases in the anterolateral papillary muscles. And in the LV, infarction was most marked in these regions, the infralateral regions of the left ventricle. 
So this is uh, an example of a patient. Um, this was a 51-year-old gentleman who was in NYHA class 3. He had an inferior myocardial infarction. You can see this full uptake of gadolinium in the inferior wall, three-vessel coronary artery disease, and moderate ischemic mitral regurgitation. You can see that the corresponding areas of infarction is akinetic in the LV. And you can see this uh, moderate jet of uh, mitral regurgitation. And he, he had a non-viable inferior wall. The question, uh, as we discussed this morning, is what should we do in this patient? Certainly, when we started this, uh, when, when we started this project a number of years ago, we almost had one or two of these patients in every uh, JCC Joint Cardiology Cardiac Surgical Meeting, and we could never agree on what to do. Half half the surgeons and cardiologists would say that we needed to um, do a mitral repair at the same time as CABG, and the other half would just would say we just do a CABG. Um, and to this day, I think the uh, debate continues, but we thought at that time what was clearly needed was a randomized uh, trial. And so we came up, uh, we designed this trial, the randomized ischemic mitral evaluation trial, the RIME trial. This was a single blinded randomized controlled trial in seven centers in the UK. Patients were randomized into two groups in a one-to-one -one ratio. In the first group, uh, CABG alone was performed. In the second group, uh, uh, mitral valve repair was uh, performed in addition to CABG. And we, perf and we used all the uh, recommended techniques for valve repair. A complete rigid or semi-rigid mitral analoplasty ring was used. Uh, either the ischemic MR ring was used, or, but if a, a complete ring like the physio ring was used, then this had to be undersized by two sizes with the aim of uh, achieving a leaflet co-optation of at least eight millimeters and leaving uh, no more than trace mitral regurgitation at the end of the operation. Uh, we included all patients referred for CABG and uh, the, the criteria for moderate ischemic MR was as defined by the AHA ACC at that time, which was an ER of 20 to 39, a regurgitant volume of 30 to 59, a regurgitant fraction of 30 to 49 percent, and a vena contractor of 0.3 to 0.69. As we heard this morning, there's been some debate about this uh, with a revision of the uh, threshold of severity by the uh, ACC and the ESC. Uh, we excluded the patients with very poor LV function and the very high risk patients, the, those with a lot of comorbidities. Our primary hypothesis was that adding mitral valve annuloplasty to CABG in patients with moderate functional ischemic MR improves functional capacity. And our secondary hypothesis was that it also improves LV reverse remodeling as uh, measured by cardiac MRI, MR severity, and BMP levels. And our technique of assessing functional capacity was by peak oxygen consumption. Uh, so these are the results. The uh, mean age of the patients was uh, 70 years. So this was an older group of patients. 26% were female. Most of them were in class 2 or class 3. The mean ERO was 0.18 to 0.2. The mean regurgitant volume was 30 to 35. And these were the uh, mean uh, LV size. They were moderately dilated and that moderate impairment of LV function with a mean ejection fraction of 40%. Most of the patients received either three or four uh, bypass grafts. Not surprisingly, the group who had the mitral valve repair had a longer uh, bypass and cross clamp time. Uh, most, in 85% of cases, the ischemic MR ring was used, the physio ring was used in 15% of cases, and the mean ring size was uh, 28. There was a high use of intra-aortic balloon pumps, up to 30% of cases in both groups. A lot of this was prophylactic, in inserted by the operating surgeon before the operation because of the high risk of these patients. Uh, the intubation times was longer in those who had the valve repair. There may be some bias in this in the management of patients who had uh, double procedures compared to a single procedure because this was not blinded. Um, the blood loss was similar, but there was greater amounts of blood transfusion in those who had the repair group, but not of blood uh, products. In terms of complications, this was similar in both groups with a 3% uh, operative mortality in both groups. The length of stay was longer in those who had the repair, 15 days compared to nine days, 
Uh, again, there may be some bias in that all of these patients were put on warfarin for three months, and there may be an element of uh, being staying in hospital longer for INR control. One year survival was similar in both groups, as was the hospital admissions for heart failure. What was striking in these uh, patients was when we saw them at one year, the patients who had the uh, valve repaired in, addi in addition to CABG were doing a lot better compared to those who had CABG alone. And you can see that this is peak oxygen consumption in blue, those who had the CABG plus mitral valve repair, a 22% increase in peak oxygen consumption compared to a non-significant 5% change in those who had isolated CABG. And we look at uh, LV volumes, this was a secondary outcome, and this was measured by cardiac MRI, a very significant 28% reduction in LV volumes in those who had the combined procedure, compared to a non-significant 6% change in those who had CABG alone. The MR volume was a lot less, not surprisingly, in those who had C uh, the combined procedure compared to those who had isolated uh, CABG. In terms of the MR grade itself, the uh, median MR grade was mild in those who had the CABG plus a mitral repair, whereas in those who had CABG alone, it was both mild mod and moderate. Uh, interestingly, um, there was a very, very low uh, recurrence rate of uh, greater than or equal to moderate MR in those who had a repair. Only 4% of patients had moderate or more MR at one year. BMP levels also decreased significantly more in those who had the uh, combined procedure, and the patients also felt better. The median NYHA class was NYHA class 1 in those who had CABG plus microwave repair, compared to a median of NYHA class 2 in those who had isolated CABG. Uh, these results were published in circulation two years ago, and we have been giving um, um, yearly updates of this. The five-year results we hope to present uh, later this year. Since the RIME trial was uh, published and presented, two other randomized trials have been published as we heard this morning, the Cardiothoracic Surgical Network Trial in the US, and also the Cardiothoracic Surgical Network Severe MR Trial, also from the US. The, the, the CTSNet moderate MR trial is very similar to the RIME trial, although it used uh, LV and systolic volume index as its primary endpoint. This was not the primary endpoint in the RIME trial, but nonetheless, we did have this data. So I have put together the data of the RIME trial and compared it with the other uh, two studies. Uh, uh, just for to, to remind us, as you know from the RIME trial, uh, LV volumes decreased by 28% in those who had CABG plus mitral repair as compared to just a 6% reduction in those who had CABG alone. And uh, MR of moderate or more in severity occurred in only 4% of patients in those who had the repair compared to 50% of those who had CABG alone. When we look at the, uh, the US trial of moderate MR, which was very similar in design to the RIME trial, uh, you can see the results are different in that in patients who had isolated CABG, 30% of them, uh, only 30% of them was, were left with moderate or more MR. So the mitral regurgitation improved in 70% of these patients with just CABG alone. Uh, in those who had the valve repair, in addition to CABG, you can see that the recurrence rate of MR at one year was 11%, which is almost three times higher than that in the RIME trial. So, um, not surprisingly, the, the, uh, uh, in terms of LV volumes, there was no significant difference between the two groups. Because if in one group you just do CABG and the, and the mitral regurgitation improves, and the other group you repair the mitral valve, but there's a high recurrence rate of MR, uh, obviously then, if you look at LV volumes, you're not going to find any significant difference. Uh, almost certainly, the, 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 this, the, the, the patients in these two uh, studies uh, are very different. Um, it, uh, unfortunately, the US trial did not do uh, LV viability assessment because that is probably, uh, that may be a, a very important factor to explain why such a large percentage of patients improved their MR severity with just revascularization uh, compared to the RIME trial. Going on to the uh, severe ischemic MR trial, I'm very pleased that Dr. Ecker is here 
Dr. Eckel presented the, uh, uh, the the results of this trial two years ago, and we we were speakers at uh, a session in Ischemic MR at the uh, AHA last November, and we had some uh, interesting uh, discussion on this. I thought when, when I left that meeting that I had to to uh, look at the results of the U.S. trial a bit more closely to better understand uh, what, what was being reported. So the primary endpoint in this severe MR trial, which was a trial comparing repair versus replacement, was also LV and systolic volume index. Um, the overall uh, change in LV volumes in those who had CABG plus microvalve repair was a reduction in 11%. The overall change in those who had the mitral valve replacement was a reduction in 10%. So this was the primary endpoint. And if you read the paper in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, it tells you that there's no difference whether you repair or replace the uh, mitral valve in terms of LV volumes. What was striking in this paper was the recurrence rate of moderate or more mitral regurgitation at one year, occurring in 33% of cases which is, of course, a lot higher than that in the Rheim trial. But what was very good was that the investigators reported the patients in whom there was no recurrence of mitral regurgitation, this third row here. And you can see that in those who had CABG plus mitral valve repair and had no recurrence of their mitral regurgitation at one year, LV volumes reduced by 22%, which is twice that compared to those who had replacement. And what was very interesting, I thought, was that when you compare this with the results of the RIME trial, a 22% reduction in LV volumes in the US study, a 28% reduction in the RIME trial. Very similar results. I think the point here is that if we do repair the mitral valve in these patients, we have to ensure that we do a good repair and uh, uh, ensure that there's no recurrence of mitral regurgitation. And certainly if we did that, there is some evidence that repair is still superior to replacement. But of course, the, um, the question then becomes to patient selection. Uh, and and, uh, we, we, and, and uh, it's important then to select which patients we may be able to offer a repair and which we, we may be able to offer a replacement. So what are the implications for clinical practice? This is a 56-year-old gentleman. He was in NYSHA class three. He had three vessel coronary artery disease, moderate function ischemic MR, moderate LV systolic function. I saw this patient uh, uh, about two years ago, shortly after I started in my new practice. Well, with the results of the RIME trial, it was quite clear to me that this patient needed to have uh, CABG and a mitral valve aneuploplasty. He's doing very well at one year. Uh, as you can see, the LV volumes have actually reduced in size, uh, and there was no mitral regurgitation at one year. The guidelines we saw uh, earlier by Dr. Teckenberg, um, it has reference the RIME trial, reference 458. Uh, so this has now become a level B evidence because there is a single randomized trial. Uh, but it has put this, it has put the results of the RIME trial as recommending mitral repair in severe ischemic MR because as we heard, the threshold for severity has changed since, uh, since the trial was done. So it now suggests that mitral valve surgery should be considered in symptomatic patients with chronic severe secondary MR. Uh, so I would like to conclude uh, by saying that cardiovascular magnetic resonance has provided additional insights into normal ischemic mitral valves. Specialized imaging protocol has been developed and it's necessary to comprehensively assess the mitral valve. The RIME trial has provided evidence of benefit for mitral valve repair in ischemic MR. Ischemic MR is a heterogeneous condition and uh, treatment must be individually tailored for each patient. Uh, there are a lot of people I like to thank uh, because the, the, the research would not have been possible without, uh, without so much support from so many col collaborators. collaborators. In particular, I'd like to thank uh, Professor John Pepper, my uh, mentor and supervisor. He's not here because he's speaking at another uh, seminar. But also uh, uh, Dr. Marcus Flutter from the Clinical Trials Unit, Dr. Kilner from the CMR Unit, Dr. Raman Haley, Dr. Isabel Rosin, all the collaborators in the Rhyme Throne, particularly Mr. Prakash Punjabi, who did the most number of operations in the Rhyme Trial, 
So Professor Jill Dreyfus, who was instrumental as well in the design of the, the, the trial, all my research nurses, all the patients and volunteers, and all the consultants in the London Cardiothoracic Surgery Training Program who gave me uh, time to do this research and were, were very supportive of this. And of course, I'd like to thank the NIHR and the Department of Health for awarding me the Researcher Development Award, the British Heart Foundation for a project grant, the British Medical Association for the Lance Steel and Lance Lawson Award, the Royal College of Surgeons for the Ontarian Professorship, and uh, the SCTS and ACTA for hosting this hunting lecture. Thank you very much. Um, just, just one slide, sorry. Uh, this is the Royal Brompton Hospital where most of the research was done. Uh, the cardiac MRI unit is just here in this old building. Uh, this, uh, this portal cabin actually hosts an MRI scanner. There are three scanners in the Royal Brompton Hospital. The clinical trials unit is up here. Uh, so a lot of work was done in this, uh, this rather old-looking building, but in a very nice part of London in Chelsea. Uh, this is the Sarawak Heart Centre where I work now. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>